Hello, everyone. We are, uh, this is our, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> let me start over. I've already messed this up, Gene. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Experience Weekly Data Talk, where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Jean Ross. She is the Principal Research Scientist at the MIT Sloan Center for Information System Research, where she lectures, conducts research, and directs executive ed education courses on IT management practices. Today, we're talking about an article that she wrote uh, called Fundament the, the Fundamental Flaw in AI Implementation. Uh, Dr. Ross, thank you so much for being our guest today. My pleasure. Nice to see you, Michael. So, uh, Dr. Ross, I always love to start off these interviews um, asking about your your journey. What led you to the work you're doing now? Uh, it's a long journey. I uh, joined MIT's uh, Sloan School in 1993, 25 years ago, because I uh, had a PhD in management information systems, and I wanted to do research on how companies could, could use technology more effectively. Uh, the research center partners primarily with CIOs, digital leaders, people like that, to identify the management practices, the strategies, the designs that make a difference in terms of getting value from technology. So when you began this research in, you know, what you're seeing today, how, how has, like, this evolved? Yes. Uh, well, when, we, when I joined in 1993, most CIOs were begging for a little bit more <laughs> respect in their companies. It, uh, they were getting a lot of blame, but they weren't getting much respect. <laughs> and, uh, and the challenge of delivering value from technology was believed to be the, the IT unit's job. They could only do its job if everybody in the company wanted disciplined processes and cared about their operational data and things like that. If they didn't care, they just wanted a system for something, IT could build it, but it couldn't create real capability in the organization. And we started understanding this around 1993, but most individual business people and companies just didn't understand why IT wasn't delivering exactly what they wanted when they wanted it. And that, that was a long battle. You know, SAP came along, and everybody thought, okay, SAP will solve this problem. We'll put in a big system, and it'll be fine. But companies couldn't get them in. And so there's just been this hmm. ongoing battle of people wanting things from technology, but wanting them very narrowly focused when what they had to be thinking about was, how is this company going to succeed? And then how does my piece fit into that? What's all the data we need? How does all that data come together? Uh, and particularly, what's the most important data and the critical processes that makes this company a success? And people just didn't think that way, even if the CIO was begging them to. And not all CIOs did, to be honest. Uh, but I think the digital world is starting to wake people up. And um, we're starting to see a lot more, uh, well, we're seeing fervor for sure. <laughs> we're actually, um, but by our data, 27% of companies have a good underlying, what we call operational backbone that lets them function effectively. Good process, good data, uh, good systems. Not perfect. Nobody has perfect systems. But it's an asset. Uh, so the other 73% are still struggling with that. And uh, one, one thing we're trying to do is help them get there faster because there's no time to waste now. When you think about highly effective CIOs today, are there any companies that stand out to you that you think they're doing it right? And, and can you share any lessons or even failures that have helped them to do it right? Yeah, there's several. Uh, one of my favorites is Schneider Electric. This is a company that sold electrical equipment. And when I met the CIO in 2009, he told me they had just acquired 100 companies so that the company now could give you any electrical equipment you needed from soup to nuts. So it was the big electrical transformers and switchboards and things all the way down to the electrical socket in the wall. And he said, so my job is to take these 100-plus companies now and help them integrate their services so we can meet customer needs. And I basically said to him, good luck with that. I mean, he had, <laughs> if he was counting right, 172 ERPs. But what he did so well and what the whole company was doing with him was understanding that it was never going to be perfect, but there was some data that was the most important. 
so they went they they said we're going to slowly go after one ERP at a time and fold it in but the most important thing we're going to do as a company is a single CRM because then we can sell across all our hundred businesses mm -hmm. it took 18 months they put it in they explained to every salesperson your life will be totally different now they started counting just cross-selling at first and it just started making a difference it was Hoped in a way that it was big enough to be a huge benefit to the company, but small enough that they could pull it off. And that is something that companies have really struggled to get right. Now, Schneider is going into the digital economy big time. And because mm. it has this underlying capability where it has folded in by now, uh, many of those ERPs, they're down to a dozen, uh, and they've got a single CRM that they can share customer data, uh, and they really have a, an attention to focusing on what matters most and getting that done and delivering something for customers. And that has made a huge difference in their ability to make progress in the digital economy. Are there, like, you can have, like, a really great CIO, very knowledgeable, very experienced, the company, the organizational structure, the business culture isn't ready the, the CIO is going to have a very difficult time. How, how does a highly effective CIO deal with business culture and organizations, organizational structure that may not be that great for the work that the person is trying to do? I, I think you have two choices. One is you sit down and you explain the roadmap. And I, I watched people at Fidelity, um, the, the financial services company, um, sit with business leaders and say, I know you all want your own thing. I know you all feel like you're independent. I, I, you all feel like you have your own products and services. But here's the deal. If you want to act but as an integrated provider of financial services to our clients, this is what it's going to take. And he identified, kind of, he, he just mapped out, this is, this is what you, we are going to need to provide for our company and for our clients. And to do this, here are all the changes in behaviors that are essential. And uh, this went extremely well in their asset management group, uh, but it was still hard when they went beyond that group because they were still taking people who had their ways of doing things, their beliefs about what was important, their their uh, their political positioning, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it, it never becomes easy. They got better and better and better at, at fidelity, and you can see it now in some of the services they can provide. But this is about you know, drawing a picture that people can really understand. And I've seen some very good CIOs fail at this. So uh, you, you can definitely take a brilliant CIO who ought to just leave. Because, you know, mm. and they, they figure that out uh, because mm. it's just not happening. Uh, but it does help if the CIO has great communications and strategic thinking skills so they can guide the, the management team. And one interesting thing, many CIOs feel like the most important thing is to be on the management team. We have found no statistical correlation with that. Turns really? Out, the most important thing is that you get to communicate with them. Uh, the, the CIO at USAA, Greg Schwartz, who recently retired, had enormous impact on that company, and he never sat on the executive team. But they knew he was great. They listened to him, and he explained things very, very well. That, it turns out, is more expensive, uh, is more uh, important than being on the team. Sometimes you're on the team, and it's kind of like they're paying acknowledgement that you're important, but they still aren't going to listen to you, <laughs> so it doesn't mm. do any good. It, it seems like if you're a CIO, you, like by default, you're on the management team. You would think. Uh, and, and, of course, if you've been working your way up the ladder all these years, you'd much rather be on the management team, but it does not correlate with having impact. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's more about having a clear path to be able to communicate your goals, objectives, and making sure they they have your back. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Are there? Um, so I think I read something that you had written about. It was I think it was a, a little critique on organizational structure, and you had you can you talk a little bit about that because I thought that was really fascinating. <laughs> Because well, I never really thought about that before. <laughs> well, here's the thing I've learned, and I've been studying what I call enterprise architecture now, all 25 years I've been at MIT. And the enterprise architecture sounds like this IT thing, and so it's like enterprise architecture, go talk to IT. But <laughs> it turns out 
that enterprise architecture is basically how you're designing your systems, your processes, and your people, and your data so that they all work together in a way that gets stuff done. Well, you'd love to just say, well, IT will take care of that, but I mean, we're talking about everything that's happening in your company, IT, yes. right? But the thing about the digital economy is it's kind of up to the speed, right? So now if I just hope that my people, my processes, my data, and my systems will kind of work together well, I just hope they won't, you know? I either design them to work together when they need to work together, that when something has to be seamless, it will be seamless. Nobody has to interrupt it. Um, I design that into the company or it doesn't happen. So here's our problem. In the digital economy, we'd love to retain our old hierarchies, but everything's happening, first of all, across the organization, not in your business silos or your product silos. It's my customer wants this product and they already have this product and they want them to work together and they already have one account so they don't want a new account. So those pieces have to work together. And what's happened historically is a lot of companies just went, well, those, those things that have to be worked out across the silos will happen at the top. Well, that takes time. I got something, I gotta go up, they gotta go over, they gotta go down, back up, back over. Not happening. So we have to design our companies to deliver to customers and for the most part, our companies are not designed that way. And, and that's a real upheaval. So where structure comes in is what we've learned is that structure kind of stabilizes things. Once you've got something working, you want to assign a structure that retains it for as long as you want it there, right? But the mm. problem in the digital economy is you actually don't know your future. You know what you used to do, and you can keep all the structures that made things you used to do work. But anything you want to do new, like at Schneider now, they're providing energy management solutions. They had to create a different part of the company to do that, and it does not look like a traditional hierarchy. This is about recognizing that in the digital world, we're taking reusable components. One of the auto manufacturers described this. He's, he said, you know, now what we have to recognize is in the digital economy, fewer and fewer people are gonna own cars. We're gonna sell cars for a long time and we're gonna to continue to make money on them for a long time, but fewer and fewer over time are gonna own cars. So how do we succeed in the long run? Well, we recognize the transportation's not going away. The desire to go exactly where I wanna go, when I wanna go there is not going away. So there will be vehicles, there will be automobiles. There just won't be as much personal ownership. So he said, we realize we have to start to create these components. One would be a, con a connection to the cloud. So I can follow you. So one, one of the components is this ability to track where that car is. Another is to communicate with the car. Another is to have a phone that can unlock the car, a phone that can turn the car on, a phone that can uh, help guide you to where you're going. So these are all components. But it turns out that if you're a great digital company, Anybody in your company can go see the, which components they want, grab them, and create the next offering for a customer. But that means I need independent component owners who make them great, and then individuals who configure those components to work with customers to deliver something. There's nothing hierarchical, hierarchical about that, and I can't rely on structure because what I actually need is going to change every day. So yes, some things will become pretty stable and I can wrap a piece of structure around it if I want. But if I, uh, but traditionally, companies start by saying, here's our new strategic initiative. Let's you know, structure the company yeah. to make it happen. That's the worst thing you can do in the digital economy. Mm. You have to do the opposite. So I think one of the issues I've seen in companies I've worked at is the problem of silos, Yes. right? Yeah. Like we're forced, like we're all working on our projects and we get stuck in these silos because we have certain goals. And unfortunately that sometimes hurts communication, right? Because yeah. yeah. I don't need to communicate to other teams. I need to be focused on my goals because I need to be a high performing individual. I need to achieve my goals, but then it hurts the rest of the company because people don't know what everyone else is doing because that's not my business. Exactly. And, and you know how we solve that problem? Mm. Matrices. 
we introduce matrices. <laughs> and <laughs> so now we are studying companies with this silo and this matrix. Oh, and then we need this matrix. And, and the next thing you know, you just go, oh my gosh, how, <laughs> how is anybody supposed to figure this out? But I'm global, I have multiple product lines, I have multiple regions, multiple functions. What's my choice? Well, the answer to that question is, you're, you're going to subdivide your company around customers, and then you're going to create independent teams. And when we talk teams, the companies doing this well are talking teams of 8 to 12 people. Mm. And then they would have unifying organizations. Um, Spotify calls them tribes, and a lot of people have adopted that language. I like that. Where, where together, uh, we have some higher level goals. And, and then we become aware because... Basically, the head of each one of those teams is a mini CEO. I understand mm. my deliverable. I understand who depends on my deliverable. I understand the rules for putting that out there for people to use. This is really hard stuff, really hard stuff. And I do not recommend that anybody say, why don't we do that to our company? I would do it to anybody who's responsible for delivering digital offerings for the components that make them up because that starts quite small. You, it turns out the first three teams go great. It's that fourth team that becomes mm. hard. Right? Uh, so if you start small as you become digital, and then you can just learn from that and grow the number of teams, and as it gets harder and harder, you can figure out how you're going to adjust. I don't think some parts of the company ever have to look like that. Some parts of the hierarchy are going to work or some core processes. But if on your digital side, you start learning what it means to empower teams, give them guidelines, help them understand the mini CEO concept, uh, it, I think we're going to get there. I see companies making huge strides in that direction. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating how organizations are, are changing, especially the ones that want to be successful. They have to be able to evolve. They have to adapt. They have to be flexible. And I... It's really interesting to see, like, the way you're talking about there are going to be certain parts of the organization that is going to be hierarchical. There's going to be other parts that are going to be more tribes, and companies have to learn to adjust and be flexible with that. Yes. And, and um, another company, and this one's put a lot of material on its website, is DBS, which is a bank. Um, hmm. stands for Development Bank of Singapore, although they only go by DBS anymore. Um but they have gone through um, multiple phases of making themselves digital, and um, they put it into their investor reports. It's really, really interesting material. Uh, so for somebody who's just trying to get their head around it, I, I'd say look up DBS online. They're really interesting. Um, Spotify has shared a lot. It's a, obviously more of a digital startup kind of company, but it's so honest about mm. this works, this doesn't work so well, and we're, keep, we're still figuring this piece out. And that kind of discussion, I think, is, is also really nice, and they put a lot online. Uh, so I, I take a look at, at those two companies, and I think it, they're really, really interesting. Yeah, it must be, it must be fascinating for, for those companies that are just starting up. Yes. Like, they're, they're in a whole new world, a new digital business world. They don't have the... I guess it'll definitely deal with the problems of a larger, old, older organization with right. older rules and processes. So they're like, they don't have that, but they right. do have their own challenges. Yes. Like being an effective tech company right now that just launched. It's very interesting because I think when you're a big old company trying to become digital, you think, oh, if only I was a startup. But um, it just looks like you get one set of problems or another. So if you're a big old company, Hopefully what you're good at is scale, uh, risk management, these things that come with being big. Um, you've got reach. You've got customers. And so what you're trying to do is work with those customers to develop new ideas that leverage digital technologies. And that's hard. There's no question that's hard. It's a fascinating challenge. And companies that start to get into it, think there's nothing better, right? If you're a startup, chances are you are never going to understand scale, and you're going to have to sell yourself because it's that hard. So yeah, you got the fun of the startup, but um, will you ever get big? I mean, we know <laughs> it's, it's only a handful. They're amazing. The, the digital yeah, yeah. people have gotten big are amazing, but there are not many of them. Uh, and that's why um, it, initially, I think the big companies are going, oh my gosh, those startups are going to take, you know, they're going to 
who just run us out of business? I don't think so. More often now they relax and say, oh, those startups, we got to go buy them. <laughs> but you have to be careful who you buy. A lot of these startups actually use very poor management. So, you know, mm. I said you'd have these components and, and in an auto company, there's these components that you just know you're going to use forever in digital offerings. Some startups, and Spotify said they made this mistake at the start, say, I know, I have a good idea, and they write one piece of code. They don't have components at all. And then they oh. want to make it better and better and better, and they end up doing exactly what big old companies did to themselves, mm -hmm. even though they live in a world where they don't have to. Turns out if you're a big company saying, oh, I think I'll go buy a startup with some cool technology, you got to check what their technology is, because if they've done something monolithic, they'll be worthless to you over time. Mm. Wow. How, and it's interesting because um, in the article that I read that you wrote around uh, the fundamental flaw in AI implementation, you talk a lot about one of the one keys of the is, is the employee training, making sure that employees are, and this is not discussed enough, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think, the importance of employees to be trained and prepared for this new world we're entering in, where we're going to begin beginning to interact more and more with artificial intelligence to do our jobs better. Yes. So here's the thing that I've learned about artificial intelligence in general. First of all, I should explain that you can build it into your product, and then it's an R&D challenge. Or you can build it into your process, and then it's a people problem. Uh, and it's actually important to figure out what you're talking about because mm -hmm. the challenges become different. I have mostly focused on, okay, I've got these people um, who could do some things. How, how am I going to make it happen? And, and what it is is, yeah, that if you have artificial intelligence, you get to take so much more data and process so much more data so much faster and consider so many more hypotheses. But if it's something that's going to fit back into something people do, you have to keep it in context. It doesn't do you any good to say, hey, I got this solution, if it doesn't fit in with what's going on in the company. So it's really the people who are doing something or will be doing something who have to imagine how the AI um, capability will add to what they're doing, how it fits into the bigger picture. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of just unrealistic expectations not so much because AI can't do it. It's because what it can do is not a good fit with what you need. Mm. And, and, and I think in, in terms of helping people do their jobs, this is what goes wrong. We want to give them this messy situation um, because we don't know what to do with it. Well, the first thing AI may make you do is clean up some of that mess. <laughs> Explain what you mean. You know, give me an ontology and then I can help you. But no ontology. I, if you don't know what you're talking about, I'm not going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I can't help you then. So I, I, I think that part of it is just recognizing that if we already know how we want to do something, we can then imagine how being – the way to think about it is what if I had unlimited data and the unlimited speed in processing that data? What would I want to know or do? You have to articulate the problem that way as opposed to just saying, hey, can't AI figure something out for me? <laughs> and I think this has been one of the challenges of AI. It's not that its expectations are unrealistic. It's that I want to take brand new ways of thinking and stick it into old ways of doing. And actually, that doesn't work. I actually think one way of understanding this is if we look at what's going on with autonomous driving. If we just put the car on a road made for an autonomous vehicle, it's brilliant. But once you put it onto a road made for people who are driving, the autonomous mm. vehicle can only do some things, not others, right? We, it can surely help us park, and it can stop us before we bump into something. And we see lots of good things. But the day when we're all going to be sitting in cars that are driving themselves, yeah. that's a little hard to imagine because we didn't build the roads for that and it's hard to imagine we're going to undo those roads and start all over again and and it's the same thing in our organizations that we've got to recognize what they can do in the context that we're putting them into mm. are you 
are you seeing any organizations that are doing a good job of preparing their workforce for this future of work? Yeah, I, but I see it like, um, and I think this is very smart. I think uh, right now it's very uh, focused, you know. So um, one of the um, pharma companies we studied said, we, we, are, we brought in some great data scientists, and, and they understand kind of what data we've got and what kind of challenges we have. And they're now going around the company basically meeting people and saying, what are you doing? What, what kind of problems do you have? And, and then starting to imagine very specific issues they can resolve. As they mm. resolve one, they start to meet more people go, wait a minute, if you did that. <laughs> you know, initially, it was all about, well, we're going to take this 10-year development cycle and we're going to make it three. Well, I, actually, I think they, made, they were going to make it seven which is actually a great thing to do. And there are things AI can do to help because it can help you get the right um, uh, subjects. You know, if you get the wrong subjects into your study, they're going to mess up your findings. It's going to take you that much longer. So mm -hmm. you know, there are things AI can help you speak up, get that right grouping um, for your studies. But they're not going to take a study from 10 down to two years if, in fact, I need to give someone the medication for three years and see what happens to them over the next Five, right? I mean, there's just a limit to how much faster. But the important thing about AI or digital in general to a pharma company is you can stop thinking of yourself as a drug company. You can now think of yourself as a disease improvement company, a wellness company. And, and then you start imagining all different kinds of ways that you make the world better. And that is what I start to see some of the pharma companies wrestling with. Right now, you know, it's like there's this infinite number of possibilities, but they started getting their heads around, you know, Watson could do X. Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> that was kind of true. But instead of solving, like, this problem, if they just said, well, we <laughs> people need this little thing, you know, the MVP approach, the minimum viable product approach. The people use this little thing, and if they use that, uh, would they monitor this? Would they respond this way? And then you just do these little experiments and see what people will do. And you insert AI where you see the moment, right? It's like, oh, wait a minute. That was pretty <laughs> smart. But what if I was using 50 times as much data? Then what would I get, you know? Um, and that's that's what the kind of thinking, it's so hard. You know, you want to just say, uh, it's going to cure cancer. Well, <laughs> uh, but could I get people to pay more attention to certain signals? Could I t collect more data on what, you know, um, you know, it could be all kinds of things, saliva, x-rays, whatever, you know. Um, the answers to those questions are absolutely yes, and they are happening. I mean, there, there's big time introductions. Well, big time is the wrong word. There are a lot of small introductions of AIs that have big time implications. And I think we need to work our way to the big things as opposed to saying, what's this big, massive problem that I'd like AI to solve? Because that, that is just not proving very realistic. Are there, um, for the organizations that are looking to do this, starting to bring their data science teams to begin to meet with different divisions, uh, are there specific divisions you think that they should start with before they move? Like, is there a certain order that they should follow? Yeah, they should start with the people who are most excited. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, you, want some, you want people who are high profile enough that when they have an idea, it's going to get circulated. And whether that's because they just happen to be positioned in the company where everybody cares what they're doing, or they're just that bigger personality, or whatever it might be, you're looking to have an impact. Because the first few ideas may be crazy, they may, they may not be very significant, and, but you gotta go with some early ideas and just get started, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if you're going to people who are gonna work with you on this, and, and they've got some issues that they wanna get resolved, and they're willing to, really sit down and do the hard work of, of explain what they know, what they don't know, and what works with non-AI processes and what it would take to uh, collect more data or what kind of data would be useful. And 
I mean, there are some decisions that have to be made. I think sometimes we think it's like an R2-D2 thing where you just go, hey, <laughs> what's the deal? And, and it's like, they, well, yeah. you know, but in, in, in real AI, you have to say, well, let's go collect this data, whether it's from the web on anybody who ever reported um, their migraine circumstances or if it's, um, you know, from public information that tells us the financials of all these companies you got to have some hypotheses of what data matters, and then you do have to explain to the system at some level. Now, there's different kinds of intelligence here, but at some level, the ontology, how these pieces fit together. And I, uh, if, if we don't explain anything, it, uh, we're just not going to get anything. Uh, so we, we just can't just say, go get a machine and have it do it. And I think that was kind of a <laughs> false promise of AI. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I love that you're, I love that approach of like, find people that are high profile enough in the company that it gets exposure, but also they got to be excited. Yeah. They, they need to be, I, I totally agree with you. They got to be excited because I think one of the, the challenges and the pushback sometimes that happens is that people feel threatened, right? They feel threatened that they're going to lose parts of their job or maybe their entire job because... Yeah. AI can do it faster, better, quicker, more efficiently, et cetera. And yeah. so if if people have that fear, they're going to be very resistant. Absolutely. You, you're really looking for people who feel so secure that they actually can imagine somebody, something, doing their job for them, and they think that's exciting. They just yeah. don't worry about, well, what does that mean for me? Because that will take care of itself. Right? right. If I'm right. the one who imagined this, surely I'll imagine something else, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And you do need that sense of security that my job is to solve this problem. I just go solve this problem and then I'll solve the next problem. It's not mm -hmm. about my job is this, I got to make sure nobody else is doing that job. And, and yeah, and that's what you see with these great people to work with is they're so excited about solving something better or faster or cheaper. It's like, whoa. Let's do it, and um, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, you know when when I first started reading these like you know these headlines about job loss and AI taking over certain skill sets, it was you know obviously frightening to read those kinds of stories. But then I began to get more excited as I was like, wow, well, how great would it be able to work? I'd be able to do a lot more things, be more efficient if I had an AI assisting me. And, and and then I was thinking, like, in many ways, we're already augmented. Like, yeah. we already have Google. We are, we already yeah. are using yeah. software to get us answers quicker, yep. right? Yep. I've even looking at math problems and things like, oh, I forgot that about. I just Google it, get it instantly. Yep. So I, we're already augmented in that That's sense. Right. So it's like it's taking it to another level. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and really, if you look at it that way, it is not nearly as terrifying as some of the things that are out there, you know. It's not like we're now not busy because we have right. AI helping us. We got busier. And and I think we have to recognize that that is what's going to happen in our jobs, too. Yeah, what I'm doing may go away, but if I'm part of the instigator of making it go away, I'll find something else to do, some other way to add value. Uh, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I'm excited. So, our, do you ever get asked about, like, your vision of the future of work, like what does work look like five years? And I know that you can't predict it perfectly, but how, you know, as you've watched things and studied organizations and changes where things have happened since the 90s and then now with like the birth of IoT and AI and machine learning and impacting companies, like where, where do you kind of see things headed and how, how soon do you think we'll start seeing it? Well, you know, we're certainly starting to see some changes um, from things AI can do, but I don't know that they're any more momentous hmm. at this moment in time than we've kind of all always had, right? I mean, even ERPs took away some jobs, right? Uh, and and it, somehow that didn't seem as nasty as this artificial intelligence thing coming in and taking <laughs> yeah. uh, But I, I really think that the, the concern is that we so 
um, train people, and I think we do this all the way back in, in their early educations, to do what they're told. We'll tell them what's important, learn this, and we really don't train people to be problem solvers, and yet I look at the world and I think it's the single most important thing. If you can be a problem solver, you will always have a role to play. Um, and any time you, you just learn a skill, you're at risk of that, the need for that skill going away. And, and so for me, the scary thing is, even to the extent we get that, and I think a lot of people get that, don't know what to do about it. We don't actually know how to train people to be problem solvers. We don't know how to train people not to be afraid when the world changes, right? And, and because of that, we're going to have a lot of angst. I, you know, people are going to lose jobs and they're going to be yes. miserable and we're going to say, wait a minute, there's better jobs out there. But if that's not your mentality, it does not mm -hmm. help that that's what I'm saying to you, right? That, I think, has to be a real concern for everyone, that we don't want to lose people. We, we don't want right. people to feel like, um, yeah, the world's changing and, and my, my contribution is no longer important and nobody cares about me. And we, somehow we have to do advance work. We can't wait till it's gone and then say to somebody, oh, not to worry, we'll train you for a new one. We've got to train them before their job goes away. Uh, and that's, yeah, it, it's easy said, easy to say, but I, I don't actually know how we're going to pull that off. But I, I don't think we, we can count on uh, publics, uh, on the um, on businesses. I think we're going to have to count on uh, a very different public education and government role, which has all kinds of other issues. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think we're going to have to get very, very thoughtful about this, or we are going to have a lot of very unhappy people. For the for the people that are, you know, working in jobs where maybe their their leadership is not preparing them for this age of AI, there's no training for them in their current jobs yet. What, what advice would you have for them that people that are like me, for example, I don't work in data science. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have any sort of background in coding or uh, the maths required. What, what sort of like, like training or education would you recommend for, for those of us in those positions? Well, it's interesting. I actually think this understanding about the importance of problem solving is at the heart of it. Because somebody says, well, what's the job that won't go away? Like, well, thinking really clearly. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Thinking really well. Uh, not being afraid of whatever presents itself next. Um, so it's actually, I would not worry about whether people are training you for new jobs. I would worry about whether they're giving you needy things to do. So regardless mm -hmm. of your skill, regardless of your job, do people trust you to solve a problem? And if you're not in a position where you get to learn how to solve problems, then I would actually look for those opportunities. So it's not a matter of can I get the right training. You may find you need some training, and then you go get it. I wouldn't start from the training to the job. I would start with the job to the training. I, I, we even see this here at MIT that this formalized, we're going to go through four years of college, and then we're ready for something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to say, okay, um, a lot of our students are going to be people who are out doing stuff, and then they just need to learn how to do something. And I think beyond the four years of college, that's more and more what's happening. Well, I better go figure out what data science is. Well, I better go figure out how to code in whatever. You know, and, and I think um, I think if we let the jobs push the the training uh, or the problem identified for us, what we don't know, then I think we'll get much more. Um, focused learning, um, we'll stop doing assignments and tests for the sake of assignments and tests, and we'll, and we'll start really learning how to learn for the sake of, of getting something done that we want to do. So maybe we'll go back to having college education being about enriching us, the liberal mm -hmm. arts, uh, making us smarter and more thoughtful, and, and then we go into how do I solve problems in the workforce by saying, here's a problem that needs to be solved, I better go figure out how to do it. That would be my dream world. I love that. Yeah, learning for the sake of learning because you you want to learn, not because mm -hmm. you're just memorizing rote facts. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's that's awesome. Um, 
I was going to ask you before we go, I think, have you written four books? Uh, three are out. Um, they're actually getting old. Uh, so I just finished a fourth one uh, with Martin Mocker and Cynthia B. That will come out next year sometime from MIT Press. It's called Designed for Digital. And um, that book is about how companies will design, uh, especially big old companies, although it's just as true of, of, of <laughs> um, how they'll redesign themselves to succeed in a digital economy. And it, it raises a lot of the issues that, that we've talked about here. That is awesome. So that's going to be out uh, next year. They, they, the original date was fall of 2019. They said they would work with us to bring it out earlier. So I don't know if that will really happen because we have to see how it plays out and uh, what, what they mean by that. So our hope is that it's before next fall. That's awesome. And are you going to be uh, speaking at any conferences upcoming? Um, only private events. Um, thank you for asking. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, no big uh, uh, public events right now. I, I speak a lot at, at MIT and in our executive education programs, uh, but no, no particular engagements right now. Wonderful. And if um, people want to contact you, connect with you, have them make, get, you know, how do we get you to speak at our at our company? What's the best way for people to contact you? Probably the easiest way is to contact me directly at jross, J-R-O-S-S, -S, at mit.edu. Um, if they'd like to learn about our research center, that is uh, C-I-S-R, we call it CISR, the Center for Information Systems Research, but the uh, website is CISR mit.edu. Okay, wonderful. That was awesome. Well, Dr. Ross, thank you so much. It was awesome chatting with you. I learned a lot. Uh, we're grateful for your time. Um, I'll make sure to uh, put in our show notes links to those different websites and also uh, ways for them to contact you uh, for more information. And uh, for those listening to the podcast, the short URL is just ex.pn slash datatalk65. Again, that's ex.pn slash datatalk65. That'll bring you over to the Experian blog post uh, where you can learn all about uh, Dr. Ross and uh, her work that she's doing. And I'll also link to her previous books that she's written. And once the Amazon link is available for her latest book so that people can order it in advance, I'll put the link there as well. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Take care. Take care.